that it is obviously not true. Okay? And here we come to that argument to start with. Uh, first of all, uh, Will, as I already indicated, Clifford Will admits uh, that uh, you can take a clock to higher gravitational potential and see that it runs at a different rate. Uh, but, and, and to me, right on the face of it, that shows that, uh, that uh, it's the radiation that is, is uh, more energetic at the higher potential. But in fact, you could take uh, both clocks, uh, well, that's in fact what he suggested doing. Take one clock up, let it sit there for quite a while, and then take the other one clock up later, and you'll see that there's been a, a cumulative time difference. The one you took up first ran the fastest. And that pretty much shows that, uh, that in fact, uh, the energy radiated at a higher, at higher potential is more energetic. I'm, I'm in, the, in the last section of the paper, the, uh, the third major section, I'm going to talk about some of the implications of this, which aren't obvious right at the right at the start. Let's go ahead to the next one. Um, how do I, just to add to the proof and show that GPS proves this, uh, GPS clocks are adjusted to run slower before they are put into orbit because they know they're going to run faster up there. Uh, the time difference, there are two kinds of measurements that are made in GPS that's very important. The, what called the code or pseudo range measurements and the carrier phase measurements. The code measurements are a measurement of the difference in time. The time of the satellite is encoded onto the signal and sent to the ground. So the, by decoding the message, we know when that signal was sent. On the ground, we use our, the time in the receiver to measure the length of time it took, and that gives us the range. The carrier phase, we undo that code modulation and we can recover the carrier phase. The code measure has one important characteristic. It's, a lot, it's, it's, it's an accurate measure of the range except for any clock errors, but also it's much noisier than the phase measurement. So we like to make the carrier phase measurement, uh, which measures the change. By integrating it, I can, I can measure the change in the range. Well, it turns out, because I happen to be the first one to do this, they call it the hatch filter, and it's on almost every GPS set. They smooth the pseudo range with the carrier. Now, if the clock didn't increase in free, if the clock didn't run faster at the higher rate, the time measurement would diverge, and you would get a lousy code measurement. Furthermore, it wouldn't agree with the carrier phase measurement, and you couldn't smooth them. So, and we typically, with a dual frequency set, can, can smooth, smooth it for 15 minutes to half an hour to get rid of almost all the code noise and be left with centimeter kinds of noise on the carrier phase. So these measurements are made in real time, and they get rid of that weak logic of, uh, of uh, Clifford Will to show that, in fact, clocks run faster at higher elevation. They don't gain frequency as they fall. Radiation does not gain in frequency as it falls. Okay, next slide. Double or nothing. Uh, I thought this quote uh, out of uh, what's generally called the GPS Bible uh, Ashby and Spilker, two great big volumes. Uh, uh, Parkinson, uh, pretty much the uh, originator, or is called the father of GPS. Uh, but, but he says the I, the only reason I put this first part in is because it said second. But he was saying this all in one paragraph. The light ray seems to have weight and be attracted by gravity. Actually, what happens is the bending is caused by the difference in speed of light. There's no attraction by gravity. Second, the strong equivalence principle implies that light traveling downward in a gravitational field is shifted to a higher frequency, i.e. it is blue shifted and gains energy. And this, as a consequence, atomic clocks at a higher elevation of gravitational field run faster. Now, if my logic is correct, that would double the effect. <laughs> uh, you know? Double fast. But, but, but this is the kind of logic you'll often see in a lot of the relativity papers. I think m many of you would agree with that. Okay, let's go on. Now I want to talk about a, a transition. I want to talk uh, uh, about uh, the rocket. Now, by claiming that the clocks run at different rates and there's no energy in falling, I pretty much demolish the argument that an accelerating rocket, it does, you will make a measure difference in frequency caused by Doppler. 
But that's not equivalent, in, obviously, anymore. They're different phenomena. Uh, the clock accumulates. Uh, Doppler doesn't accumulate, uh, if you will. So, so I wanted to address, uh, in, in, a, in a paper, I, I made this argument, and I thought I had put the equivalence principle to bed. Uh, but in fact, uh, Brad Parkinson sent my gravity paper to a prominent theorist again, and, uh, and he came back and he said, I read a little bit of it, uh, I saw an error, and I didn't read any more, and I don't want to hear back. <laughs> so, so I wrote another paper uh, addressing his argument, and uh, his argument will, will come up. Uh, he, he fundamentally claimed that, yeah, okay, in an accelerating rocket, the two clocks will run at different rates, just like the other one. So that's the next argument that I need to address. Uh, next slide, a little bit more on the transition. The paper, I, the original paper I wrote, I argued that the forward clock and the aft clock, because they were in the same accelerating frame, would run at the same rate. Well, it turns out I did make a minor mistake. If there's length contraction, then there's a frequency effect in the fourth order of the inverse C. <laughs> Rather small, <laughs> but, uh, but it'd be easy to take care of with a micrometer or, or nanometer to spread them apart. But in any case, um, uh, this led to the claim that uh, infinitesimal Lorentz transformations will cause the clocks to run at different rates. So that's what I address in the next section. <laughs> Again, uh, he hasn't made any progress with his theories recently, so he's been working on his resemblance to Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look at authorities, Goldstein, Meis Meisner et al., uh, Mueller, and Ashby, and I talk about several different topics here in trying to prove that I, uh, in infinitesimal Lorentz transformations don't really work the way they think they do. And uh, I'll, I'll look at an uh, alternative hypothesis, the clock hypothesis that's uh, been written up by uh, Professor Goy in Italy. And then I want to look uh, at some clock biases and, and then compare the two clock hypothesis ILT. Look at, some, at the GRACE satellites, which uh, show a problem. And uh, finally, the solar gravitational effect on clocks. OK? Uh, these are just references to some of the quotes that I will look at. Uh, let's go ahead. Goldstein claims that a particle being accelerated with respect to the laboratory can be linked to the laboratory frame, frame via a Lorentz transformation. The Lorentz transformation instantaneously matches the particle's accelerating frame to a frame moving at a velocity v with respect to the laboratory frame and thereby gives an instantaneous mapping between the two frames. Turns out that, that's equivalent to an infinite series of infinitesimal Lorentz transformations. What does that do? The primary thing that does is it keeps the clock, it keeps the speed of light at C because the Lorentz transformation was derived as a way to force the speed of light being C in every frame, inertial frame you're working in. Uh, he claims it has important applications in atomic physics, and that's primarily based on the uh, Thomas precession effect, which it's used to explain, and we'll look at that briefly. And, uh, yeah, okay, that I've already said. Let's go ahead. Um, I think this one may be slightly out of order, but we'll go ahead and address it. Uh, the uh, infinitesimal Lorentz transformation causes, when you add two Lorentz transformations that are not in the same line in different directions, it turns out, mathematically, that causes it to rotate. But people have said, where in the world does the torque come from that causes this thing to rotate? You've made it mathematically rotate. What physically makes it rotate? Uh, Mueller wrote a paper uh, that uh, he said, uh, Thomas Procession, where is the torque? And then he came up with a way to get some torque. Uh, namely, he, uh, he showed that uh, if spin does length contraction and inertial mass increase, then that moves the center of mass offset from the center, and that will cause a torque if you're putting the force on the op total object in the middle. Well, I think his explanation is pretty close to being exactly the way I would expect it to be, uh, but that would double the effect again if you still claim the mathematics. This mathematics has nothing to do with the Lorentz transformation mathematics. So again, we pick up whatever explanation we think might fit the data and use it. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, the clock hypothesis by Goy, when I wrote, first wrote this paper on this,